Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by TRX Dinosaurs. They have innovative puppets, poseable sculptures, and animatronics. And you can find out more on their website at trxdinosaurs.com. And by Permia, makers of the coolest prehistoric clothing and collectibles this side of the Holocene. Their scientifically accurate t-shirts, hoodies, stickers, and figurines are available now at permia.com. This week, we have an interview with Jingmei O'Connor. We have Dinosaur of the Day Zuniceratops. And we have a bunch of dinosaur news, including the second and third days of SVP. But before we get into all that, we want to take a moment to thank some of our patrons. And this week, we would like to thank Scotty, Megan Dixon, Kessler, Tristan Jules, Grandpa Dino, Rhinosaurus, Morgan Eklov, Dr. Eigenbot, Taylor, Lori, Risa, Kelly, Manda, and Laurasaurus. And Laurasaurus just joined, so thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for all your support. It really helps us keep this podcast going. And it helps us afford to go to places like SVP. And actually, we're recording this just before we go to London because Sabrina's work is taking us there. And I said, I'm coming because <laughs> I've never been to the Natural History Museum in London and neither of us have seen the Crystal Palace dinosaurs or lots of other dinosaur stuff that we're going to try to jam in. So hopefully you'll be seeing stuff on our social media posts and or YouTube or we'll just talk about it on the show later. Who knows what's going to happen, but <laughs> we'll be doing a bunch of dinosaur stuff while we're there. So we're both pretty excited about that. Yeah. Just really quickly, we haven't really talked too much about the Natural History Museum in London, except for about Dippy. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. But I, mean, I haven't seen it in many, many years. I don't even remember how many years, so I might be able to go with Garrett to see it. But we did talk quite a bit about the Crystal Palace dinosaurs, including an interview with Eleanor in episode 91. So if you want to freshen up on your Crystal Palace dinosaurs, which are a very interesting group of sculptures, then check out that episode. Jumping into the second and third days of SVP, the first talk for today we're going to talk about was about sauropods and specifically what sort of age distribution were sauropods living in. So what Waskow and others found was that most sauropod fossils are adults. That makes sense. I guess so, but a lot of times, like with tyrannosaurs and stuff, there are very few adults. Well, they probably lived a harder life, whereas sauropods, once you make it to an adult, you're pretty much safe. But the question of how many of them made it to adulthood. Mm, true. I suppose, though, you have a good point, because you only fossilize if you get buried in a specific way, and the sauropods that didn't make it to adulthood may have just been eaten. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> so, and if you get eaten, your chances of being fossilized go way down. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Maybe as gut contents. Maybe, but then, yeah, you're not necessarily going to be identifiable <laughs> as a sauropod. <laughs> but I suppose that's why we say most sauropod fossils are adults, not most sauropods were adults. Oh, I'm sure there were way more juveniles than adults. Probably. I mean... We don't know for sure. Well, we don't know for sure. But the, I'm thinking in order to have that many adults survive, yes. there would have been probably a lot of juveniles. It does appear that they did the whole like sea turtle style <laughs> of raising where you just lay a whole bunch of eggs, bury the nest, and then Hope leave it. Hope for the best. Yeah. <laughs> and then most of them get eaten by predators, but every once in a while one of them survives and then lives like 100 years. But anyway... Even though most sauropod fossils are adults, with dwarf sauropods, we see a little bit of a younger distribution. They're still mostly adults, but it's closer to 50-50. And the way that they tested this during their study is by counting the lags in ribs. Lines and, of arrested growth. Yes, just like counting rings in a tree. And what they would also look for is skeletal and sexual maturity growth points. And the second interesting thing that they discovered was that those maturity dates varied between diplodocoids and macronarians, which are two of the bigger groups of sauropods. And therefore, you could just find a single rib of a sauropod and be able to tell if it's diplodocoid or a macronarian 
based on the ages where it became both sexually and skeletally mature, which are different ages. Usually it's sexually first, then skeletally, which is useful for this kind of research. The next talk was by Roy, and they looked at several different models of E. cheese extra wrist bone. <laughs> if you haven't seen E, it's this crazy sort of bat-like dinosaur. It has what are called patagial membranes, which are things that you see in bats and flying squirrels and pterosaurs. And it's that not, it's like uncovered skin that is used like a wing. And it looks like it had this extra wrist bone sticking out that helped sort of spread that membrane across the area it needed to spread it in order to be able to glide because we think it probably was a glider. And yeah, so they were looking at some different shapes that the wing might end up being depending on where that wrist bone was oriented exactly because we can't tell for sure which direction it was pointed. And that obviously has really big implications for how big the wing is too because if it's sticking out straight at like a 90 degree angle from the wrist this long rod, you can get a lot more surface area. Whereas if it's sort of at a more narrow angle closer to the arm, then it's not going to cover as much area and you'll have relatively smaller wings. So to, it's a good thing to study. They didn't really come up with a lot of results. They came up with several that they thought were reasonable. <laughs> so hopefully there'll be more follow-ups on this where we can kind of get a better idea of what Ichi's wings were like. Because like we talk about with Jing Mei, we only found one of these. So we're going to have to wait and see if we can find some more or maybe come up with some new clever ways to analyze a fossil and learn more about how it behaved and how it flew slash glided. Up next was a talk by Hartman, and he started his talk by saying that basically the ground up versus trees down sort of methods of evolution that we've traditionally thought about for dinosaurs evolving flight is a false dichotomy, and really that it was more complicated. And just like we talked about last week with the bipedal versus quadrupedal and how that evolved and it was happening lots of times in different ways, same kind of thing was probably happening with flight. And he had a funny slide where he said, where do we go from here? Well, he prefaced it with, <laughs> he's a dad now, so he can say dad jokes. Yes, yeah. and where is W-A-I-R for wing-assisted incline running. Mm -hmm. so this is a pretty solid dad joke. <laughs> and he also pointed out that, just like we were talking about last week with the evolution from bipedal to quadrupedal, it's really influenced by which fossils you find. And he had a little example where he was like, if these are the hominids that you found, this is what animal you'd think humans evolved from, basically. It was just like such a giant puzzle with so few pieces. It's very difficult to piece together. So instead, what he focused on was sort of how flight seems to evolve just generally in these different adaptations. And he put it into four phases, which I thought were really interesting. So the first phase for developing flight in his model is that there are these characters that are unrelated to flight but are useful later and are sort of necessary in order to get you on the path towards evolving flight. Probably the biggest one here is bipedalism. You have to have your four limbs available <laughs> for turning them into wings in order to have any hope at developing flight because unfortunately animals tend not to evolve extra limbs. So you can't have a quadrupedal animal that just evolves two wings out of its back. At least we've never seen it happen. I guess it's theoretically possible. Gargoyles. Yeah. <laughs> but unlike the quadrupedal dragon things that are in Game of Thrones and stuff like that, we don't have a lot of hexapods. Pretty much every vertebrate on land is a tetrapod with just four limbs. So if you need two of them to be wings, you're going to have to make do with just two legs. So yeah, that's the first phase. The second phase are things that are exapted. This is the phase that he says takes most of the evolution. And it's things that you might evolve for something else, but then end up being used for flight. That's what he means by exapted. So that could be things like wings, because you could evolve wings for something like wing-assisted incline running, or jumping farther, or gliding, which includes both of the ground up and trees down hypotheses, or display structures, you know, like a peacock. In addition to wings, you've also got feathers, which obviously can be used for display and, you know, thermoregulation and things other than flight, and then other similar sort of exaptations. Then the third phase 
is things that are directly selected for. Now, these are things where it's like the expectation is that the animals are actively evolving towards flight. So they're developing certain muscles, basically, or maybe a larger range of motion, maybe some skeletal changes and things that make their flying more efficient. And then the fourth phase is for longer flight duration, which is sort of similar to the third one. It's, you could draw the line in different places. But that includes things like a keeled sternum, which allows for that larger muscle to attach, losing gastralia, so they're out of the way and you know you can fly more efficiently, you can get your legs in the right positions and all these types of things, and other similar adaptations. But I think it's a really useful way to look at the evolution of flight, to sort of look at these phases and you can start to think about like, where were they, not in terms of the evolution towards modern birds, but instead how far had they evolved in their own specific evolution towards flight so that if you're looking at multiple different lineages and they're all trying to fly in these different ways how many of these features do they have and how far down that road are they are they just bipedal and they have some feathers or have they started to develop these skeletal structures that seem to show that they're really spending a lot of time trying to increase their flight duration so it seems like a useful useful framework that they came up with the next presentation was by Manasada. I'm sure I got that wrong, but it was an excellent talk. And what they were looking at was could dinosaurs abduct their legs? And basically that means kind of pulling their femurs up to their sides. And long story short, the answer is no, they can't. <laughs> they actually presented on this last SVP. And the way they did it was they took a bunch of chickens from a grocery store and sort of tested what sort of range of motion they had. We talked about it at the time. But they got a lot of feedback that, oh, you didn't really look at all the things you should have and, you know, those chickens weren't the best example and so on and so forth. So they updated their methods and did a much better representation of this sort of question and still came to the same result, but it's a much more complete answer now. What they did is instead of just taking a chicken and sort of pulling it in directions or looking at all the different dimensions that a leg can rotate, they specifically added a 3D representation of all directions of rotation and then they switched to a quail instead of using a chicken because chickens have been heavily influenced by human selective breeding and quails have not. <laughs> so even changing the subject... And then what they did is they modeled the bones only digitally, as well as the ligamentous mobility. And the ligamentous mobility was a physical thing that they did. They basically pulled the leg around to see just like the range of motion that you could get the thing to move in. And part of that is because the range of motion is really complicated. And originally they were just kind of looking at how far could it move in each axis, but it turns out that they move in more complicated ways, like we saw with the alligator turkey arm. And when you account for these sort of independent motions and how they can sort of bend and twist as they rotate, then it's more complicated than just like, oh, they couldn't move in this axis as far as we wanted to. So after they did all of this mapping, they found that really the range of motion of the actual quail leg is only about 5% of the expected envelope where you could potentially pose it using just the bones. So 95% of the space where you could align the bones and it might look reasonably possible is impossible because of the ligaments and the muscles and things that are holding it in place in the real animal. And one ligament in particular called the ischiofemoral ligament is the main one that restricts mobility and Fortunately for us, that occurs in all extant archosaurs, meaning that it probably occurred in dinosaurs and pterosaurs too. And you can find the attachment sites on extinct bones. So you can find this corollary for what's limiting the motion in modern quail legs. And you can find that same point on a bone in an extinct animal, like a dinosaur or a pterosaur. And then you can see, well, where would that ligament have been and would it have allowed them to bend their leg in the way that would get them sort of out of the way? And what they found was that, no, the, they were not capable of moving their legs out of the way. And the only way they might have been able to do it 
was if their ligament was 63% more flexible than the modern ligaments, but it's pretty consistent in the modern archosaurs, so there's no reason to think that they had some crazy flexible ligament that we don't see anywhere else. So as we say, the most parsimonious answer is they couldn't get this bat-like pose that pterosaurs are often depicted in. Very interesting. The next talk was also very interesting. It was by Pittman and others, and what they were looking at was the evolution of birds and how they evolved flight and also sort of the phylogeny of birds and like which dinosaurs are closest related to modern birds. The way that they define birds is aviale, the technical term, which is the group of dinosaurs which are more closely related to modern birds, also known as aves, than to deinonychosaurs, or also known as raptors. So that's where they draw the line in terms of what they're calling birds. And obviously you can tell by that definition that the closest relatives to birds, in air quotes, are deinonychosaurs. So things like Velociraptor. And then they said the next closest related were the Troodontids, which are sort of similar looking little creatures. <laughs> well, some of them look like birds. Yeah, small, bipedal. We think they had feathers, all that kind of stuff. But getting into the actual research that they did, they found that by using the wing loading of the different dinosaurs, which is the body mass divided by the area of the wing, which we think needs to be about 2.5 grams per centimeter squared. And the specific lift, which is the ability of the muscles to basically lift the animal. <laughs> Sabrina just gave me a funny look because I'm like flapping my arms like I'm flying while I, I think through it. And that needs to obviously overcome gravity, which is 9.8 newtons per kilogram. You can estimate whether or not a dinosaur could fly. And they found that Microraptor could glide, but probably not fly, and that Changuraptor would have been able to use its tail for pitch control, and also Rahon Avis probably could also fly based on these sort of thresholds. But many Truodontids were close, but weren't quite small enough in order to get off the ground. They just weighed a little bit too much, so they couldn't get over that body mass to wing area ratio. So there's a little bit more... Support, I guess, for the people that want to consider AVLA, the group that we call birds, because we like to think of birds as flying and troodontids couldn't fly. <laughs> Next was a talk by Field, and they were looking at this really awesome new Ichthyornis skull that they found. And the reason it's so amazing is that enantiornithine birds, those are the toothed birds <laughs> for the most part, for lack of a better word, tend to have really crushed or poorly preserved skulls. So it's really hard to sort of see the structure of the skull. You can see a lot of the bones, which helps you identify what group they're in, but it's hard to see just the shape of their head, which is what you want to see for, you know, a lot of sort of behavioral stuff and just making a good recreation of it as well. So they gathered a really nice enantiornithine from Kansas and they composited that skull along with three others and recreated the Ichthyornis skull, which was published earlier this year in Nature and we talked about it. Basically what they were saying is that Ichthyornis is pretty much in between Archaeopteryx and crown birds, which are the modern birds. And that's because Archaeopteryx has the small premaxilla and a large maxilla. The premaxilla is this weird bone. The easiest way I have to describe it is to think about Dilophosaurus has a really obvious one. There's sort of a gap in the front of their mouth. If you look at their upper jaw, in the teeth, there's like this front section of teeth, and then there's the section of teeth that runs most of the head. And the front section of teeth is on the premaxilla. It's actually a separate bone in the skull that kind of runs over the top and then plops down in the front of the mouth. Whereas the maxilla is behind that, which is sort of the side of the skull. Like if you see a T-Rex skull and you have like that, that big side view of it with all the teeth in it, most of that is the maxilla. So Archaeopteryx has a pretty small premaxilla, but the large maxilla. Whereas crown birds, the modern birds, have a really big premaxilla and almost no maxilla left. And it's really interesting with Ichthyornis because the maxilla is full of teeth and the premaxilla is toothless. So the premaxilla has basically just turned into a beak at the front, and then there's a bunch of teeth in the maxilla. 
And then in modern birds, obviously, there there's no maxilla and there's also no teeth. So it's kind of interesting. That's almost like you could just project this pattern farther down the evolutionary tree. And then another interesting thing was that there are these things called occlusal holes along the premaxilla and maxilla, which are basically holes that the teeth can go into when they close their mouth. It's like a weird thing. But also sperm whales have almost the exact same look in their skulls <laughs> for their big teeth to fit into when they close their mouth. So just kind of a fun random fact about ichthyornis. Also speaking of skulls, Sepka talked about some brain endocasts. This was a really fun one because it's basically talking about how intelligent different birds are. Hmm. And he said, quote, birds are the only group of animals that rival mammals in terms of brain size, end quote. Uh-oh. Yeah, I'm convinced that dinosaurs are going to re-inherit the earth. But <laughs> he points out, a lot of us know parrots can use tools and lots of other fun little things. You know, like you can see birds dropping hard nuts into a road to oh, like yeah. crack them open. Crows and, like to do that. Yeah, they're, they're very smart. So they created a phylogenetic tree of 6,714 bird taxa. That's a lot. It's like 67% because there's about 10,000 of them. And then they created these amazing graphs of the brain size changing over time. And what you see is that it really exploded after the KPG extinction. And it's near a maximum today. So it's like they've just been increasing and increasing, getting smarter and smarter all the time. And not all birds are still getting smarter, but some of them are, like parrots and crows seem to be getting smarter, and they have this steep slope where they have the highest overall brain size ratio. And in parrots, what happens is the brain size increases as the body stays about the same size, but in crows, both the brain and body size are increasing. So their brain is getting larger at a rate faster than the body, and they describe that as the primates of the bird worlds because that's kind of what we did. We got bigger, but also our brains got bigger more rapidly than our bodies did. So, yeah, you got to watch out for those crows. Basically the moral of the story there. Well, they're one of the birds we know. They can remember faces. Yeah, they are very smart. And they said they might even have a higher neuron density than mammals. So even if their brain is getting really big, it might even be more dense. <laughs> so pound for pound, a smarter brain than mammals, which is pretty amazing. Oh, no. Yeah, but not all birds are really smart. They said that pigeons and doves are actually decreasing in brain size. Is it because they rely on people <laughs> to feed them? I don't know why. But also water birds generally increase in brain size over time, except for loons. Loons are apparently not very smart. So I'm guessing it, you know, it probably has to do with the traditional stuff like what they're eating. Maybe parrots and doves are just eating seed, whereas crows are trying to eat all these like nuts and maybe scavenging, doing raccoon-like stuff where they have to be a little more wily. I more adaptable or something. Yeah. But watching these graphs of like the intelligence of birds and you see it explode at the KPG and then there's like this very top of the graph that's still increasing for crows. It's a little terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Up next, there was a talk by Meyer going back to the less intelligent dinosaurs talking about sauropods. No. <laughs> And specifically, they were looking at a French trackway that switches between narrow, intermediate, and wide gauge in the same trackway. And he said, quote, the animal does whatever it wants, <laughs> 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 which is really important because we often, we don't talk about that much on the show because I haven't researched it very much, but they often describe sauropod tracks as either wide gauge or narrow gauge. And we often kind of group them into these different categories as if that means that they're a different animal or a different group of animals. But really, what we see from these trackways is that, like you said, the animal does whatever it wants. So the gauge of the trackway could just be a behavioral thing. And in fact, they see the track gauge isn't related to age or the environment, meaning the stability of the ground. And... The fact that we're seeing these different wide and narrow gauges throughout the Mesozoic is probably just a sampling effect because there are places where it looks like 
the animal is turning. And while it turns, it just kind of switches its stance. Hmm. <laughs> so that makes sense if you think about people kind of do whatever we want. Yeah. But we, I mean, we generally have like a similar spacing of our legs. I, traditionally, what it is, is I think sort of a width of the pelvis that they're trying to infer from how far apart the pe- feet are. But I guess it, it turns out not to be as good as we thought. And they also talked about that Cal Orco Bolivia trackway, which has thousands of tracks of sauropods and chylosaurs and others. And it also shows a lot of variability. We've talked about that trackway before, too, with its incredibly difficult to get to it's like a sheer wall that goes up really high and you Mm -hmm. have to take like some buses to get there but they're not that reliable so yeah i guess this whole narrow versus wide gauge track maker is not the most reliable way to figure out what animals walking changing gears quite a bit (laughs) the next article was by farnstrom and talked about triassic poop (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah in fact they had like a jurassic park but it was replaced with triassic poop and what they were looking at was basically what is in the poop and they put it in a synchrotron which is maybe the most analysis poop has ever gone through in history but amazingly they could find lots of bugs inside the poop using this high resolution basically x-ray and They could even differentiate subtle differences in the poop, which was important because they said they didn't know what to expect inside the poop. Because you never do. No. I mean, they didn't know what it ate, right? And they want to know what this dinosaur is eating. They put in a late Carnian, which is from the Triassic, Poland specimen, and they estimate that it was probably Sukian, which is like crocodilian-ish, as well as a smaller dinosaur form who created one of the other poops. The coprolite was about 16 to 22 millimeters in diameter and about five centimeters long, or about an inch by two inches. And it was really interesting because they found lots of beetle remains inside it. And they could even distinguish the wings and the beetle tibia, they call it. I'm not sure if they actually have tibia or if that's just what we call that part of the leg on a beetle, but it's pretty amazing the resolution that they could get inside the fossilized coprolite and they think that it was probably a medium-sized insectivore so it could have been something like Silosaurus, Silosaurus, which had a small keratinous beak for picking insects off the ground like modern birds and the other may have been from a theropod-like animal from the Norian which is right after the Carnian in the Triassic and in its fossilized poop they found fish scales archosaur bones and teeth including a crushed tooth and they said the most parsimonious answer for the crushed tooth is that the animal crushed its own tooth while eating something and then swallowed it which sounds horrible yes so (laughs) painful but it i guess it makes sense for animals that are losing lots of teeth all the time i mean we don't do that so it's hard to think about but yeah I guess like a shark probably swallows a lot of its own teeth too. Do you think it hurts going down? I can't feel good. (laughs) And they also found that 50% of the coprolite is bone in this one that was theropod-like, which is similar to a tyrannosaur. It's just a crazy amount of bone. If you think about 50% of its poop is bone. It's like it's eating so much bone. Why is it? (laughs) Is it getting enough nutrients? Yeah, I don't... Getting plenty of calcium, that's for sure. (laughs) And since there were abundant bones with bite marks, they are guessing that it was likely osteophagous, just like a tyrannosaur, and probably just eating bones of animals or maybe just eating animals whole and not worrying about the bones in them. Maybe that helps explain the crushed tooth. I don't know. Yeah, so one of them was, I guess, very tyrannosaur-like and just eating a ton of bones. It's pretty crazy. Must have had a good bite force. Yeah. Up next was a very popular talk by Frieder, and they talked basically about whether or not raptors hunted in packs, which is a very popular topic, especially among Jurassic Park enthusiasts. So they looked at Deinonychus and Tenontosaurus specimens primarily for this, and you might think, why Tenontosaurus? Well, that's because 
raptors appeared to eat a lot of tenontosaurus. So it's useful to look at the prey as well as the predators. There have been fossils known for a long time of sort of bone beds of raptors that appear that they were in a group because they're all buried together. But later they found that one of the raptors was killed by intraspecific combat. And at first that might make you think, okay, well, they probably weren't hunting together if all of a sudden one of them's turning around and eating the other one. But apparently in animals that hunt together, this isn't all that uncommon. He points out that social animals do sometimes kill each other, as we may know from being humans. So <laughs> that's not necessarily evidence that they were or weren't hunting together. But there are a lot of benefits to hunting together, even if you do occasionally eat each other. You can get bigger prey, you have higher success rates, you tend to have shorter hunts, you get increased yield from the hunts, basically because they're more successful. And on top of that, you can protect the thing that you ate or are trying to eat from other predators. So something else isn't going to come up and try to scare you away if there's a whole bunch of you potentially. And on top of that, outside a little bit of the social behavior is just protecting the young. So you have more likely to have successful offspring if you're feeding them rather than just kind of ditching them sauropod style. <laughs> But obviously, not all animals do all of these things together. There's a spectrum of pack hunting. So the most advanced type of pack hunting is called cooperation. And that's something that we see with cetaceans, in particular killer whales or orcas, which do something called wave washing. And that's where they sort of all swim in a formation at a little ice flow with a seal on it, for example, and they'll make a wave artificially go up over the thing and wash the seal off to hunt it. And it's really important because they have to be very well coordinated in order to do this because if any of them are swimming in a different way, then they're not going to make the wave that they're going for. So they have to be cooperating very effectively for this to work. But then there are lesser forms of, there are more simple forms of pack hunting called coordination synchrony, similarity, and just passive, which can also result in some of these advantages, but may not have the same level of intelligence. So even if we find that they were hunting together, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're hunting together and communicating and doing all sorts of complex behaviors. They might be doing something else. So for example, people have proposed that maybe they hunted like a Komodo dragon, which is described as an agonistic species, which are aggressive to one another. They practice cannibalism, which is also common in lions, chimps, wolves, killer whales, and capuchin monkeys, apparently. I didn't realize they were all cannibals, sometimes at least. <laughs> and we could test to see if they're like Komodo dragons based on whether they are eating the same thing, basically, because young Komodo dragons are arboreal, so they eat insects, and then later they become terrestrial. So if there's this ontogenetic niche partitioning, we would see changes in their diet over time. And one way to check that is the carbon-13 isotopes in their fossils. So what we see in Komodo dragons is that the carbon-13 changes over time for these non-social crocodilians, for example, because they're eating different things. So when they're young, they're eating fish, and then as they get older, they start to eat larger prey, and they have different ratios of this carbon in their body. On the contrary, though, we see that social mammals are nearly constant. There's a very slight change in social mammals when they're nursing, because milk has a slightly different carbon ratio than they get from other sources, but obviously dinosaurs didn't nurse, so we would expect to see a really flat level of carbon in dinosaurs if they were pack hunting and they weren't doing this weird ontogenetic partitioning like we see in Komodo dragons. So what they did is they took a bunch of Deinonychus specimens from the cloverleaf formation and the antlers formation, and they looked at how their carbon-13 ratios compared to goniofolidid fossils from the same place, and those are crocodilians. So we expect crocodilians to have the same change as modern crocodiles, and that's exactly what they found. So you see that same sort of change in diet because they're not hunting together. So when they're young, they can only hunt certain size of prey, and as they get bigger, they can hunt something larger, and their carbon-13 isotope changes. 
And they found the exact same thing in Deinonychus. It looks almost exactly the same, but there's a little bit less data. So you don't get as nice of a curve as you do with crocodilians, but it just looks like you'd expect it to look. They're eating different things when they're young and different things when they're older because they can't hunt the larger things by themselves and they're not hunting in packs. Then what they did, just to be very thorough about it, is they looked at the Tenontosaurus to see if the prey is different. So maybe one hypothesis could be that, well, young Tenontosaurus have a different carbon ratio than the adults. And then so if the young ones are eating the young Tenontosaurus and the old ones are eating the old Tenontosaurus, but they're hunting together and it's like they're just training the young ones to hunt on the younger animals, then you'd still see it. But Tenontosaurus looks pretty much the same. So we've not, we're not seeing a big difference there. So it doesn't look like there's any evidence of them eating the young versus the old. And there's also no evidence that the young Dromaeosaurs were like up in trees or doing something totally different in terms of spatial separation the way Komodos do. So the simplest answer is that they were probably just asocial, probably hunted on their own, just like we see with most dinosaurs and all of our current depictions so unfortunately the best evidence now seems to show that Deinonychus probably was not a pack hunter and from that you'd extrapolate that other raptors probably weren't either unless we find something else new up next there was a talk by turner where they showed sort of another one of these guinea fowl <laughs> walking through soft mud and then they did like slow-mo motion capture on these birds walking in mud so that you could see exactly how they made their footprints and the sort of looped path that their longest middle toe makes through the substrate while they walk. And what they found was basically they make these wider loops, these bigger steps through the mud when the mud is softer. And you can look at the entry versus exit point of that longest toe to see just how deep the foot sank or potentially from which layer it is. And then they created a model of the substrate with nine and a half million particles. <laughs> so it's like if you imagine a ball pit with nine and a half million balls and a foot going through it, then that's how they simulated the foot going through it. And they showed sort of a mixing of the layers, which is a really cool thing because if you do them all as individual particles, you can put these little bands, you can imagine bands of colored sediment, like a layer cake, in the thing that the dinosaur is stepping through. And then based on how it gets mixed up, you can infer how the dinosaur was walking, which is just crazy fancy and really cool to see. And they talk about these new things that we've never heard of because there's no language for it, but like nested Vs or upside down volcanoes, <laughs> different sorts of nomenclature that you never see because we don't really look at the three-dimensional shape of footprints very often. But it can be really useful because you can actually recreate the exact anatomy of a dinosaur foot if you can make a really good simulation of exactly how a foot would move through varying types of sediment. So it's pretty awesome. It'd be really nice to be able to recreate the exact step of a dinosaur. And they actually showed one where they showed the skeleton of a theropod, like a non-avian theropod rather than the guinea fowl that they were experimenting on going through and making a track that they have measurements from. So pretty soon we might know exactly how some of these dinosaurs walked, at least how their feet moved through the dirt, which is a big part of it. Though apparently you don't necessarily know their gait because you're just saying the sauropods. Oh yeah. Sometimes are wide, sometimes are narrow. Yeah, that's true because yeah, it doesn't mean that they always walk the same, that's for sure. Up next, there was a talk by John Hutchinson, who we've actually interviewed before, and this time he was giving a talk about how dinosaurs evolved flight, basically. It's like, it was a popular topic this year. And one of the things he mentioned was that hind limbs are very important for takeoff and landing. So when you're modeling how a dinosaur flies, you need to model basically the whole animal because there can be complex relationships. So for example, some birds, when they take off, I think he said like 90% of the force can come from their legs because they're kind of jumping up into the air. So if all we're looking at is the wings, we're missing a big part of how the dinosaurs actually fly and how they took off, as well as how they landed too, because some of the landing forces are caught by the legs too. 
one of the interesting things that they discovered by doing some modeling and measurements were that baby bird muscles were strong enough to flap larger, more adult-sized wings, meaning that these baby birds don't need really large muscles, and that might mean that maybe dinosaurs with less muscled wings could still achieve a pretty good flap, maybe wing-assisted incline running or other useful behaviors, even though they didn't have the huge muscles that later dinosaurs would evolve. But one of the limitations is that the musculature and sort of the tendons and the way that the bodies were structured of these early birds were quite a bit different than modern birds, which means they probably had a pretty different posture, especially while flying. So they might have been like more vertical in the air, whereas, you know, birds are pretty horizontal when they fly now. Maybe Archaeopteryx was a little bit more upright which, funny enough, kind of aligns with the way that juvenile birds do wing-assisted incline running today, if that turns out to be the case. But even if they did use a more modern sort of flight stroke, it wouldn't have been as powerful in that position, but like I said, it might have still been enough to be useful and maybe get a little bit of flying going. So even though these ancient birds may not have flown exactly the same way modern birds did, they likely still could get some pretty good flaps, (laughs) even with their slightly less impressive muscles. And maybe they just used a different posture or just, you know, made do with what they had, but it was still useful for them. The next talk we saw was by King, and they measured one, two, and about four to five-year-old Cetacosaurus specimens, and they were all in one awesome bone bed block with undistorted 3D skulls and a whole lot of postcranial remains. It's a really awesome looking find. And so what they did was they CT scanned it because they're so tightly intermixed that if you try to separate it, you'd likely damage things. So sort of what they're trying to do right now with that with that Utah Raptor project in Utah, where they're all so clustered together and it's really difficult to excavate it if you could stick that whole thing in a ct scanner you could skip some of this preparation but obviously this is a little bit smaller so they could actually ct scan it better and what they focused on for this talk was the sort of ontogeny and the changes that the psittacosaurus went through as it grew up so first of all the very young ones had a short face which had sort of a rounded, compact skull endocast or brain case. They described it as a spider web of vascularization on the back of the brain case. And what that indicated is that there wasn't a lot of extra space in the brain case. So that spider web is actually the the veins and the arteries that supplied blood to the brain that were squished right up against the edge of the skull. So there wasn't any extra space in there. It was like the brain was taking up the whole brain case. There wasn't a bunch of empty space because even though we often see brain cases and we kind of use them as an estimate for brain size, it's always possible that there was a brain in the brain case, but then there was a bunch of extra space kind of around it and, you know, just some fluid or something kind of holding it in place that wasn't the actual brain. So maybe it wasn't as big as a brain case. But in this case, since they're saying there are all these veins kind of like smooshed in (laughs) at the back, that means that the brain was pushing up against the outside of the brain case. And therefore that the brain case is a good estimate of the full brain volume. So we don't have to worry about it just being like extra space in this case. And then interestingly, even though it was very round and compact in the one-year-old, By two years old, it elongates significantly. It almost like doubles in length, and it goes from being sort of spherical-ish to being much longer and kind of more cylindrical or something. And especially you see the increases in size in the midbrain and the olfactory tract and bulbs. So it looks like they're kind of developing these other senses a little bit more and, as they call it, unfolding the brain. So it looks like there were some pretty significant changes happening with these early Cetacosaurus brains, even like a year after they were born, which is kind of weird compared to humans. Our brains don't really change in shape (laughs) as we age, but theirs are changing quite a bit. And then we listened to a talk by Erickson, which was all about how hadrosaurs grew in high latitudes, or in other words, you know, near the poles. And what they were looking at was Ugrunalak, which was found in Alaska, and originally it was thought to be a Pleistocene mammal, like a mammoth. (laughs) But 
after further investigation, eventually we figured out that it was a dinosaur and a hadrosaur. And when they did histology by cutting open the bones, they found the growth rings. But strangely, they, you can see these little marks on almost like a weekly basis that shows that they were at high latitudes. You don't see these sort of growth rings at lower latitudes, kind of like lags, but obviously much more frequent. Interestingly, though, you don't see those sorts of lines in the long bones, and they assume that's because there was something called osteogenic momentum, which basically means that the femur and similar bones were constantly growing, whereas some of the shorter bones, like a radius, might have been affected more by changes in food, so the growth might slow significantly for some bones, but other bones might kind of keep growing at a more constant rate. That's kind of a I don't think that hypothesis is super well supported right now, but that's what they're guessing for it. And what they found was that Ugrunalak was much smaller than its massive cousins like Edmontosaurus, which might be because of dwarfism from living in the Arctic, but it could also be that it just wasn't as big of a dinosaur phylogenetically because Edmontosaurus was pretty huge. And one interesting side note from their study was they say that you shouldn't believe all growth estimates because very young dinosaurs might not produce lags or the lags might be destroyed through the growth of the animal. So you can see these sorts of crazy curves that makes it look like they were putting on an insane amount of weight in the first couple of years of their life. But really, those years might have been, rather than just like one or two years, it might have actually been like four years. And then that really changes the growth curve and it's important to look for something called halos, which look kind of like lags, but they're not as clear of a line. They can also show a year of growth, but sometimes also they get completely destroyed depending on how the bone is formed. Specifically for Ugranalek, it looks like it took about 12 to 14 years to reach maturity. And at that point, it was about 18 to 19 feet long, which would be about, what, five meters? Five to six meters. Pretty big. Yeah, but not nearly as big as a Montosaurus. True. The Alaskan dinosaurs are pretty fascinating, though. Yeah, they mentioned that if they were there year-round, they would have missed out on a lot of food for about four months out of the year when it's super dark up there. So that could cause them some problems, potentially. And last, Sertich presented a new chasmosaurine, which is from the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, and he described the area as remote and rugged, which means that they usually have to lift out the specimens with helicopters. And so far they've found three named ceratopsians in the area, and they think there are seven individuals of this new ceratopsian with varying levels of completeness. But overall, it looks sort of like a Utah ceratops, I guess I would say, but it has some significant differences and it's from about 75 to 76 million years ago. And so far, they're just calling it the Kaiparowitz Chasmosaurine. That's pretty catchy. <laughs> it's, yeah. We'll see what they end up naming it when it gets officially named in a description in some journal. And now in non-SVP-related news, you've got a 130-million-year-old fossil from Hebei province in China that's been found. And they found two thigh bones and five tail bones and scapulas. They think it's probably a new genus of dinosaur, but it's still really early stages, so there's not too many details out yet, but they think it's going to shed more light on the origin and evolution of vertebrates. Nice. Yeah. Also in China, the Baofenglong fossil recently went on display at Chongqing Yongchuan Museum Town Hall in China. The skeleton is 80% complete. It's of an herbivorous dinosaur that lived in the Jurassic about 160 million years ago, and the dinosaur was about 49 feet or 15 meters long. The Baofeng Long Fossil was one of the most complete dinosaurs found in the area at the time with a really well-preserved skull, and it was fully excavated back in October 2012. It took three different excavations to get it all out. But there's this really sweet husband and wife, well, kind of bittersweet, mostly sweet husband and wife story behind it. So this husband and wife, they guarded the fossil for 14 years. Liu Yunshu the husband originally found the dinosaur in 1999 while he was cleaning a drainage ditch at his home, and he called the district management office and then decided to save the bones until the complete skeleton was excavated. But at the time, news of the find spread, and there were rumors that dinosaur fossils could cure rheumatism and cancer. So people might have wanted to try to take the bones for themselves. 
So Leo Yongshu guarded the fossils, and during the day, and he and his wife, Wu Xiangqiang, kept watch, and they slept near them at night, and they did this for six years. But then Leo Yongshu was diagnosed with advanced laryngeal cancer in 2005. So while he was in the hospital, his wife still kept watch over the fossils, and he understood he actually told her to do this. After he came home, he couldn't watch the fossils the way that he was before, so he used fish lines and bells that he tied around the fossils to help him keep watch, to alert him if anyone was coming. There were, as I mentioned, three excavations to get it out, and then in October 2012, all the fossils were found, but unfortunately, Leo Yunshu died in April of 2012, just a few months before that, and his wife still lives in the house. She's really proud of what they did. Yeah, it's a really nice story. Mm-hmm. It's also nice that even though there were legends that they might help cure cancer, that he didn't succumb to that, yeah, you know, and try it out for himself. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't tell exactly because this was a translated article, but it sounds like they got married sometime in the middle of doing all this watching over the fossils. And last, we have an update to the Tumblr Ridge Museum Foundation in British Columbia in Canada. So back in March of this year, the museum closed because of a lack of funding. The Tumblr Ridge District Council voted against the $200,000 funding request for the Peace Region Paleontology Research Center and Dinosaur Discovery Gallery this year. And we talked about it when it happened. Yeah, and their super long name. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a mouthful. <laughs> the research center in the museum, they have the largest dinosaur fossil collection in British Columbia, including tyrannosaur footprints. The museum actually temporarily reopened for the summer season. They had some fundraising. They raised $150,000, but they need a more permanent funding solution. So residents in the area were given a survey. They could choose to either continue to fund the museum if they added more services and displays related basically to families and tourism, or they could continue to fund the museum the way it's been run, or they could choose to not fund the museum. And 46% of residents voted to fund the museum with added attractions and services. So the council is looking for the museum to have programs and events that encourage people to come back multiple times. And Charissa Tonneson, president of the Tumblr Ridge Museum Foundation, said that they're happy with the results and they're looking for ways to make the museum more attractive to families. They're still working on plans, though, so nothing has been announced yet. So that's good that this community is working together. Yeah, that's nice. I like museums when they add more services, too. So I'm, I'm sure the people in that area want more reasons to go to the museum, it sounds like. Yeah. And before we get into our interview with Jingmei, we want to pause for a word from our sponsor, TRX Dinosaurs makers of innovative puppets, posable sculptures, and dinosaur animatronics. And we've mentioned quite a few dinosaurs so far that I think would make good puppets or animatronics, especially like maybe an Ichi puppet. Oh, yeah. You could make some really interesting things depending on how you interpret their (laughs) crazy bat wings. Could do a Satakosaurus. Yeah. You could also do like a really fancy one Like last week when we were talking about the musculature of their jaws, you could try to recreate their sort of palinal feeding with the way that their jaw moves in a way that we don't see in any modern animals. As a puppet? Yeah, or as an animatronic. You could also do a a little display of Deinonychus and Tenontosaurus. Like just one (laughs) rather than a pack of them? (laughs) No, no, you could have... Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yes, good point. A little standoff. Or you can have a posable sauropod sculpture or puppet or something and then make it walk in crazy ways. <laughs> With its gait varying in width. Yeah, just however it wants to walk. That's a complicated one. True. It would be interesting to see if you could actually make it show it making footprints, make a dinosaur sort of animatronic where it makes footprints as it walks. Oh, uh, yeah. That would be very complicated. But I'm sure they would try it if you wanted Another fun one might be to show some of these bipedal, quadrupedal transitions. You could have a juvenile walking either bipedal or quadrupedal, depending on the dinosaur, and then have the adult walking near it with a totally different style. That would be pretty neat. Or perhaps a puppet variant of that, Mm -hmm. because puppets are always great. Or you could get any other dinosaur that you want, because they make everything custom to order. And if you'd like to order any of these dinosaurs we mentioned or one that you know of that we didn't mention then head over to trxdinosaurs.com and you can also follow their works in progress on instagram at trxdinosaurs and now on to our second interview that we did at svp with jingmei 
We're at SVP today with Jingmei O'Connor, who is a professor at IVPP. No. IVPP, the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology nice. of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Well, that explains why you were saying that it has the the man silhouette. Exactly, it. it's the double P. You can't forget about them. And it's actually <laughs> kind of cool. The institute is organized in a way so that you go, like, with um, as you go up the floors, you go like through increasing like evolutionary complexity. So like the bottom floor of researchers, anyways, is fishes, and then the top floor is like the paleoanthropologists. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So yeah, the reason we're talking to you is because you had an amazing talk on lungs in a dinosaur. Yes. Could you? Thank you. <laughs> I don't want to try to summarize it, so I'll just ask you to like tell us what you found. I can uh, tell everybody the highlights. So um, it's this amazing specimen. It's the fifth specimen of a primitive, a basal ornithomorph bird uh, known as Archaeorhynchus spathula. And this, spec- this taxon is actually really well known. There's already three papers published on it. Its skeletal morphology has been very well documented. And it's commonly resolved in phylogenetic an- analyses as the basal most ornithomorph. So it's very important in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyways, we had this fifth specimen, and it was the first specimen to preserve significant soft tissue. So we looked at this specimen. If you look at it, it's like it looks like roadkill. You know, you see the silhouette <laughs> of all the feathers. You see all the major plumage uh, structures are preserved like the tail, and we see a tail morphology that we've never seen in any other early Cretaceous bird, uh, but something that's very common in living birds. It's called a pintail morphology. So originally, we were just drawn to like the very obvious thing about the specimen, like the cool plumage, the fact that plumage was never known before in this taxon. So we uh, wrote a paper just about the plumage. And of course, you had we kind of like went through the other soft tissue that was preserved because we were mentioning it has spectacular soft tissue. And it had these like this weird speckly white material that was preserved like uh, in the dorsal portion of the thoracic or abdominal cavity. Mm-hmm. And it was something that, you know, we'd never seen before. And me and my co-authors have seen thousands of specimens, right? You know, like we've Literally thousands of specimens, <laughs> and we've never seen anything like this. Like thousands of specimens from the Jehol. Like, you know. mm-hmm. and so we knew this was something weird. But you know, we were like, well, we'll investigate that later. We just, I don't know, we weren't really that interested in it at the time. But after six rounds of review, this paper got rejected <laughs> because we had just said in a passing statement, like, yeah, there's this other weird soft tissue. It looks like, based on anatomical position and the fact it looks paired, it's probably the lungs. But like. Moving on to the feathers, which is like the point of this paper. <laughs> Anyways, we got rejected for that, and uh, which is totally bizarre. But it all worked out better in the end for me because now we got it. You know, now we we actually went back to the specimen. We took some SEM samples and we looked at it, and lo and behold, there was microstructure of the lung, like lung mm-hmm. microstructure preserved, which I really didn't expect. Mm-hmm. I was like, even if that was preserved lung tissue, I figured that any actual inf- informative uh, morphology would have been obliterated. Yeah. And for example, like uh, there actually are a couple other fossil lungs that have been uh, described and they were actually described very very recently so like when I had started this paper versus when it finally went to PNAS like I didn't research for fossil lungs and they had all come out during that time that, like, <laughs> so actually like one of the main things that the reviewers said were like you do know this is not the first fossil lung and I was like oh I'm so embarrassed you're like it uh, was what I started I swear yeah well, you know, whatever, whatever it's like shame on me for like not you know doing a cursory Google Scholar search <laughs> but uh, so but the cool thing is that these are the first informative fossil lungs so there's actually um, an even older early Cretaceous mammal that's uh, about 129 million years old Spinolestes it's very cool you guys maybe I've talked about it before um, it preserves tons of soft tissue, preserves the lungs, but all you can say is like, it had lungs, which of course we can assume, we can infer that yes, that, you know, all these animals had lungs. So ours actually gives us microstructure that is informative to the question of how the advanced respiratory capabilities of modern birds evolved within pair avies. So that's very cool. And so basically what it tells us, um, well, it's like there's two features that like kind of connect to each other. And so we have to like go through them sequentially. So first, um, a feature of living bird lungs is that they're, uh, the lungs are embedded in the ribs. And this makes the ri- the lungs completely rigid. So our lungs in like expand and they decompress and they expand. Mm-hmm. So this is un- this is not how bird lungs function. They have like they are basically breathing in and breathing out at the same time. It's really cool, mm-hmm. right? So anyways, they have this rigidity of the lung and the rigidity of the lung allows the perichyma, the functional tissue of this organ of the lung, uh the- which is responsible for the gas transfer to be able to subdivide itself to uh, like ex- to an extreme amount in order to increase surface area for of course absorbing oxygen and th- in order to meet the extremely high demands of 
powered flight, you know, the high oxygen demands. So, um, so what we see in this fossil is we see that the, the intimate association of the lung tissue with the ribs, mm -hmm. same as we would see in living birds. And then when we looked at it under SEM, we saw this extreme subdivision. If you looked at the size of the air cells, it's same as a, a, a similarly sized living bird, oh, cool. about three microns wide. And, uh, and, and, you know, it's really bizarre. So of course you have to beg the question, like, how did this preserve? Like, how could this happen? You know? And, you know, I've worked on a lot of really cool, bizarre soft tissue preservation in the gel hole. So I've gotten it before where people are like, I don't believe it. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, come on, man. Like, I'm just like, come see it for yourself. Like, or if you don't believe it, tell me how I can prove it to you. Don't just sit there and be like, I don't believe it and re reject all my papers. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Anyways, but no, I mean, I, I think it's good for people to be skeptical, but you, you have to provide like you can't just be like no 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 you have to provide an to avenue for yeah, yeah right. for further investigation or if it cannot be proven you have to admit it can't be proven and mm -hmm. like and I mean I do that sometimes we're like we can't prove it but we think this is what it is you know mm -hmm. anyways sorry so I, I diverge <laughs> I think you mentioned during your talk that you actually got kind of a lung expert to That's join your paper going. right yeah thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> so you know uh, I'm a geologist I'm trained as a geologist and so you know. I, my bio my understanding of biology is limited and biology is incredibly complex and mm -hmm, like you know, mm -hmm. anyways so um, I mean even within paleontology I like I feel like I know nothing <laughs> except about birds mesozoic birds nothing else <laughs> um, anyways so uh, I was reading all these papers about bird lungs in order to be uh, able to make interpretations about what I was seeing but anyways so um, I decided to like why torture myself and also have to deal with like all this crap in review like I mean of course I want give me crap give me crap I can deal with so I just knew that like you know, like, why not show this to a person who studies living bird lungs? See what they think. Do they think it's lungs? Sure enough, he did. He was the one who lent me most of the interpretations that we used in the paper. And the truth is, he is convinced. So this, you know, should lend a little bit of credibility to the skeptics that are yeah, out there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for sure. And it, I'm sure it adds a little dimension to your paper, too, because you can speak in the lung anatomy sort of vernacular yes. rather than just saying, like, it looks like a lung. And Yeah, I was before my talk, I realized, because, you know, I don't um, verbally communicate a lot. I just write a lot of papers. Yep. So mm -hmm. I've, like, written these words a million times, but mm -hmm. never said them out loud. And so I was, like, <laughs> sitting in my hotel room, like, perichymatous, <laughs> per perichymatous. Very kind of does, you know? <laughs> Anyways, I hope I didn't mess it up in the talk. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the number of people that would know that you messed it up are probably exactly. pretty yeah. small. <laughs> I knew I was safe, but still, there's going to be that one <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Cool. So I think you also mentioned that there's a bunch of like gastroliths in the sort of abdominal cavity too. So uh, every specimen of archaeorhynchus, Archeo like all five, they all preserve uh, a complete intact gastral mass hmm. and it's a uh, like the largest gastral mass that we've seen in any early Cretaceous bird so based on comparison of the size and number and you know proportions blah 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 of the gastral mass we can infer that it was probably a granivore like you only see such a large gastric mill in living birds that are granivorous hmm. and also the taxon is completely edentulous so we also as like a general pattern in the evolution of tooth loss and the evolution of the beak you know which is like a, a character that ultimately does characterize all birds but it mm -hmm. doesn't in the beginning it only yeah. characterizes like new or the living bird clade or the crown clade rather so um and we now know we of course know that the beak evolved many many times but mm -hmm. it seems to at least within the ornithomorpha like where we have evidence and we can make inferences it seems that you can have a gastral mass but not lose your teeth and then maybe you weren't an herbivore you know mm -hmm. or maybe you weren't like obligatory herbivores but it seems that we do have complete loss of teeth only when we have really large gastric mills. And we mm. also, in some taxa, have evidence that they were granivorous, like um, this taxon, Eo granivora. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> creative with my names, um, that we recently described. It was actually described years ago, but they misidentified it. And it was like, they identified it as a Hongshan ornis. And that just made it really like, like Hongshan ornis is a wading bird. Like, why would it be a granivore? And it was like mm. really hard to like, to make these, you know, this, this information, like, put it together in a cohesive evolutionary story or to understand it. And then I went back and looked at the specimen. I was like, that's not a home genre. <laughs> so we, we re-described it and it's, uh, yeah, it's very cool. So as a granophore, that means in the Cretaceous it was eating like seeds, mm -hmm. basically? Yeah. Yeah, and so we have a lot of early Cretaceous granivores, like Jehlornis is directly documented to be a seed eater. Hmm. Also, Sapiornis mm -hmm. um, is cool because it seems they're eating different seeds, you know, but unfortunately, we know so little about early Cretaceous botany right. that, like, we can't, we're just like, it's not like any seed that we can really 
see today, but yeah. we don't know what it is, and we don't know what planet comes from. And it's like so there's a lot of work to do there. But I know everybody gets more attracted by the flashy things, like yeah. <laughs> myself included. So I, I don't blame everybody. But yeah, it's very cool. And then we have multiple early only two morphs that are granivores. The only one where it's directly documented is Eogrinivora, but mm-hmm. then we do assume it in uh, or we infer it in uh, Archaeorhynchus. And then we don't have any uh, granivores in the Enantyornithines. We don't have a single. We have mm-hmm. like. So we have maybe like a hundred specimens of only two morph, right? And mm-hmm. then we have like over a thousand and anti things. And this is like a conservative estimate on both sides. And, you know, for so we have like a hundred Jehornis and maybe like 10% preserve evidence that they are granivorous, right? Yeah. So we have thousands of enantyornithines and none preserve a gastric mill of any kind wow. or preserve any evidence of a crop or also, you know, preserve, yeah, like, or preserve any direct evidence of what they were eating. It's really, really Interesting. bizarre. Yeah. So it means, like, whatever they were eating is something that just, like, doesn't preserve readily. I mean, but you think, like, there's other in, in evidence that they were eating invertebrates, but you think that would preserve? And I don't know. It's really bizarre. And I, I have been saying, like, maybe it means they had a more primitive digestive system, mm-hmm. which I know actually doesn't make sense if you look at the phylogenetic, if you look at everything in a phylogenetic context and you see, like, you know, for example, the recent paper on Anchiornis mm-hmm. showing that they regurgitated pellets, that they also ha- already had a crop. So if this is primitive to avies, and why would? But it's also like you know. So of course, an anti should have it. But then, like, why would they not utilize it if they yeah. were so diverse? You know, and right. like, it's really bizarre. But, okay. but, um, then anti ornithines are they all? Do they all have teeth? No, there's Gobipteryx that doesn't have teeth, and then there's another taxon that I'm working on. I've been working on for a long time, um, but it was published in an abstract in a, um, a meeting, you know, years ago. So it's sort of been out there. It was, it was published at SVP two in an abstract. But anyways, it's another um, late Cretaceous. Edentulous and anti okay. But we also like, uh, yeah, you know, we there's also based on abstracts, we know of faunas where edentulous and toothed and anti ornithines coexist in the same fauna. Oh. Hasn't been quite published yet, but you know, well, it's been published in abstract, but yeah, it's uh, it's cool. There's a lot of there were so many people giving talks and they're like, oh, we need more information about this and that. And I'm like, I'm working on it. Yeah, got so many projects going on. <laughs> well, like, you're at like <laughs> ground zero for all of these fossil finds, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, also, I'm really lucky and you know, I love collaborating. And uh, so, you know, I, a lot of people bring their birds to me or, or act, invite me just to help them with them. And, uh, and I love it, you know, and, and then, you know, all you know, but you have so much data in your mind that's not published yet. And it's hard <laughs> right. to like separate what like your thoughts, ver- like that you can verbally communicate in your thoughts that like are just, you know, you still have to, I don't know. Still <laughs> yeah. Waiting, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You need like other people's opinions and stuff to kind of refine it. Yeah. Well, you just like, you know that you can't say something yet because y- you know that this is the truth, but you, but what is in the published data you would draw a different conclusion and you yeah. technically can't draw the new conclusion until this other stuff is published. Yep. Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of that, especially in places like this where we're finding these new dinosaurs slash birds all the time. And every time we find a new one or not every time, but a lot of the time it kind of like rejiggers the phylogeny of all these other birds. Too. And I love it. I mean, we, well, like the bird phylogeny hasn't been like that, uh, uh, you know, it's been pretty stable for a while. It hasn't been that exciting, but like my, one of my favorite dinosaurs is Ichi. Mm-hmm. And like when we discovered that, like that, really just changed everything like yeah. just yeah. completely like broke down all our previous ideas about evolution of flight and all these things and i love that like it's so exciting to mm-hmm. like to know that at any day a specimen could come out and change everything so i am constantly being like look we don't need to take sides we need, don't need to get like hell bent on supporting a certain idea because everything is going to change like yep. don't people just get too um invested in these yeah. ideas and we should be much more plastic with our you're much more flexible yeah right especially it's like that whole clade basically like 80 percent of it has been discovered in the last decade and you're gonna like put a <laughs> you're gonna carve it in stone yeah <laughs> i can't Wait imagine what it would because i like started working on things like around when you know things were really starting to pick up mm-hmm. so i just can't imagine what it would be like to be somebody who studied it like 30 years ago and then being like oh, all these new birds <laughs> you yeah. can't just remember their delusion names, really. information yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a crazy amount well, of so what's that saying like we don't know what we don't know yeah yeah. The only true knowledge is knowing we know nothing. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's been like, I'm so lucky to um, be able to work in China where I have access to all these specimens. I'm constantly telling people like, you know, like, I'm not a great scientist. I do my best, but I'm not great. I'm not brilliant by any means. There's a lot of really brilliant people out here that just like blow me away, you know, like, but uh, I work really hard and I'm really passionate about what I do and it, it means a lot to me. And uh, look, it's the specimen that gets me the nature paper. It's like really like I'm just like really lucky to be able to work on these incredible things, you know. Yeah. yeah. Does the IVPP, that has an insane number of feathered dinosaur fossils, right? Well, not as many as the Shandong Tianyu Museum of Nature. Okay. Like that's, the, that's a place where I do, I do a lot of research. That's where this specimen is from, actually. The, okay. the lung specimen is from there. 
Um, also, like, you know, we published a couple years ago, like, Ichi is also from there, by the mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we published a, a paper on, like, 229 specimens of Ancuornis in that single museum. <laughs> wow. I think at the IVPP, we have, like, five. Okay. <laughs> you know, like, and, like, only one has feathers or something. I've never even seen the feathered one. Like, <laughs> we have the holotype, though. <laughs> nice. awesome. But, yeah, the Tanyu Museum is just, it's an incredible place. And so... Uh, is that closer to where they're actually found? No, it's a uh, so it's in Shandong and all the okay. other stuff is mostly from Liaoning. So um, Liaoning, like there's like the Bohai Sea, like Liaoning, mm -hmm. and then Dalian has that like little peninsula that comes down, and you go around the sea, then the um, province below is Shandong, where right? gotcha. it has a little peninsula that comes out, and closes the Bohai Sea. Yeah. Anyways, that's where my family's from, my or like my wow. grandparents are originally from there. Cool. Uh, and it's just uh, you take the bullet train, you know, and it takes you two and a half hours, and you, then you arrive at the home place of Confucius, and then you hop in a car, and in an hour you're at the biggest dinosaur museum in the world. <laughs> wow, yeah, it's really fun. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So actually, you mentioned I Chi. Were you involved in that one? Yeah, I was. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm like stuffed back there down the author list, but I'm just really happy to be in, have been involved at all. But I was there with Xu Xing and Corwin Sullivan, who was like the other really main author in the paper, when they first saw the specimen. Mm -hmm. Or actually, I think maybe Xu Xing had seen it before and he was going back to see it again. It was like the first time Corwin had seen it. And we were all looking at it. And we we're all looking at that weird bone in the wrist. And we were mm -hmm. all just like, had no freaking clue. Like, and like in <laughs> retrospect, I'm like, we're idiots. Like, how can we not see that? But like, but then Corwin's like, we're not idiots. Like most people like would never have thought of that. There's very few people who are aware of this like element in flying squirrels, whatever. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so we all looked at it. We're just like totally dumbfounded, you know? And then Corwin was, uh, went back to, we went back to Beijing and Corwin's writing this book, this incredible book that's called From Fish to Humans. Mm -hmm. And it's all about, um, you know, the fossil record in China, but it's in English and in Chinese. It's very cool. It's won a lot of awards, totally plugging it. <laughs> um, but anyway, so he's doing research for this book and he's reading about these flying squirrels and he just like has that little light bulb <laughs> over his head moment. And then we went back and we tested it and sure enough, it was in fact bone so that we, or like, you know, less highly ossified than the rest of the bone, but like more cartilaginous, but still like a very interesting. And I mean, it's just so cool because, you know, like before there was like people who would argue, like I would argue for multiple origins of flight. And I just feel like Ichi like solidifies like this idea. It just adds so much support to the idea that flight has evolved multiple times within AVs. So previously we would look at things like Microraptor and birds and like sort of try to stuff them onto like the same like progression, you yeah, know, right. be like four wing flight down to two wing flight. And it's like, no, four wing flight is an independent, like evolution of volant activity, like probably not powered flight. I don't know. Like, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's a lot of people doing research on it. Uh, you know, we'll see. I, but, uh, but yeah, it's definitely independent. And like, when you look at something like Ichi, where it's like, you have a Manny Raptorin, but it's forming a wing, like, like Microraptor and birds have the same type of wing. It's a wing formed by feathers. But mm -hmm. here you have an animal forming a wing like a bat or like a pterosaur. It's a completely different structure. And there's not even any evidence that they actually had panaceous feathers. So, like, mm -hmm. they could be even more primitive. Like, I place them actually within the oviraptorosaur, like basal oviraptorosaurs, mm -hmm. which how cool is that? Flying <laughs> oviraptorosaurs, right? <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, oviraptorosaurs we know have panaceous feathers. So, I mean, it just... It would, it, just, it would be odd if they secondarily lost such a feature. So maybe they're even more primitive, you know, like, I don't know. It's very right. cool. Yeah. There's still lots of stuff to work on and uh, things to discover. But yeah, it's one of my favorite dinosaurs. And uh, if you look online, you'll find this really, like, really terrifying reconstruction that somebody did. I wish I knew who it was <laughs> so I could, like, give them a shout out. But whoever you are, I love it. It gives me nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that the... It's got its mouth wide open. Yeah. I don't remember what it's about it's like to eat. Wings like this. Yeah. yeah. It's really cool, right? It's a little bat like, if I remember. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. very bat like. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a small animal, so I guess it wouldn't really be that scary in real life, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, cool. like if a pigeon was coming at you like that, yeah. it'd probably still startle you. I would probably still scream and run away if <laughs> yeah. a pigeon yeah. flew at me. You know? <laughs> or a small bat, even. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm actually like a. Uh, kind of afraid of birds don't really particularly like them i mean since yeah. i started studying birds i've developed this like intense love and fascination with them mm -hmm. but like before people are always like oh like do you are you a birder like oh you <laughs> must love birds and i'm like like no i just like my love like I, when i started studying birds i i actually did it thinking like oh this will be like a way to get myself to china this will be a way to like um you know and like you know because i was told paleontology is hyper competitive a way to like you know uh, make sure that you can stay uh, relevant you know whatever mm -hmm. so um that was my original like motivation for choosing birds so now i like totally love them but at the time like yeah i mean i'd been like chased by this chicken once yeah like, while i was doing field work in inner mongolia <laughs> and i was like i hate birds and, like every time a pigeon flies by i'm just like bird mites like oh, oh yeah dirty birds you know, but <laughs> i totally understand <laughs> <laughs> but birds are really cool they're just amazing you know like this i don't know i've been like 
I just love telling people all these like just random like weird factoids about birds, but uh, living birds. But I won't do it right now because I'm really not an expert on them. But if you have any more <laughs> questions about the, the Mesozoic birds, then yeah. <laughs> so Ichi, just one more thing about Ichi. Sure. <laughs> do we even have any other Mesozoic animals at all that have that crazy sort of extra bone in the wrist for pterosaurs? Oh yeah, pterosaurs. Yeah, and pterosaurs have it on their ankle too. I think some of them. Oh, some okay. of them. Yeah, yeah, they have. I think they have two pairs. Cool. Uh, various morphologies and things. Yeah. But we don't have any other dinosaurs yet. No. Yeah. This is the first dinosaur to fly with a membranous wing. <laughs> yeah. It's really cool. I love that thing. Yeah. It's it's just so spectacular, and it's cool too because the Scansoriopter rigidae, which is like the worst, <laughs> like the hardest <laughs> name to say, but they're one of my favorite groups. But you know, they were so enigmatic, and all the other specimens we had before were juveniles, and none of them preserved this soft tissue. And then you know, finally, you get this one specimen, and it just completely changes everything. Thing that yeah. we knew about this group. Yeah. Did that one... So I saw a talk, I think yesterday, where they were trying to figure out like the angle of that wrist bone. When it was found, did it have any sort of outline of the wing? Um, well, once we figured out that this was probably, um, you know, uh, something like like the pterosaur bone in the pterosaur, so, yeah. you know, then we were like, okay, then there should be soft tissue. And sure enough, there was traces of soft tissue uh, preserved. But you can't, you know, because like the specimen, you know, and it's even the same with birds. Like even with birds, we can't, like all the measurements about uh, avian, like avian wingspan or like uh, in the Mesozoic, they're all based on skeletal measurements. They're not mm. based on the feathers at all. Gotcha. Which like to me is intuitively like, no. <laughs> but like yeah. my friend who does this research has explained it to me and I'm like, okay, like... Just dropped a bunch of math on me, and I and I respect you, and I know you're really smart, so I guess I buy it. But to me, it's just like counterintuitive, you know. But but anyways, um, the point is like you really can't measure like accurately figure out what the wing was like because it's never preserved. Like yeah. this is exactly right. how I would be in a flight posture in like normal flight they or whatever. Don't you know? Die mid flight. They're, they're crumpled. You know, yeah. the wing is folded, and it's the same with his membranous wing. Like it's pretty impossible to figure out exactly like with this specimen, anyways, to figure out what the, how the membrane would have been arranged. Gotcha. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think we saw a talk today, too, where, like, one of the big caveats was, like, we're assuming an avian wing shape, like a modern bird. And he's like, I know that that's probably not a great assumption, but I don't know what else to do. But here I go anyways. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm just really lucky to have specimens to be able to do pretty much purely specimen-based research. But, like, uh, you know, and it is important to try to take the specimens and do more. But it's just also really important to remember that a lot of this stuff is, like, the error, every assumption they make, the error just increases and increases. Oh, yeah. And it's just like, right. in the end, it's just a thought experiment. Yeah, you know, it's really nothing concrete. Not mm -hmm. to like, not anybody, but like, you know. <laughs> it's, it's soft tissue can go I'm just that like trying quickly. to defend my like plodding along and just doing taxonomy. And <laughs> <laughs> but I you know I'm, it needs to be done, you know. But sometimes I feel like I'm not as cool as all these people who are like, got the models and the math. And I'm like, oh, you make me feel dumb. But no, no it's, it's really cool that there's a, such a diversity of paleontologists doing so many different things. And like, once you get a specimen out there, then other people can come at it from different specialities. We have different ideas and we really, really should be open sharing data and not view each other as like competition, you know, yeah. like there's literally infinite research to do out there. Cause when you have a question, it just leads to more questions and like, we never get it right the first time. So it's just like, I don't know. It's just very frustrating uh, that this kind of attitude uh, that we have towards each other still persists anyways. I agree. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned in terms of paleontology is competitive and getting to China was the end goal always to get to China? Well, sort of. I mean, I did it right from the very beginning. Like, uh, I was always fascinated with my Chinese uh, heritage. Mm. And so uh, when I, you know, that guy you met, Don Prothero, so he, I told him I want to be a volcanologist. And he was like, okay, but he's a paleontologist. But then I took his class, historical geology, and was like, whoa, like, oh my God, you know, like paleontology is so cool. And also at this time, like Microraptor had just been discovered, all these things. And I was like, wow, all these cool fossils coming out from China. Like I want to combine, you know, paleontology with doing work in China. I want to work on Chinese fossils. Mm -hmm. So he emailed everyone he knew in the LA area because he, he was at Occidental College. That's where I did my undergrad. And so uh, Wang Xiaoming of the LA Natural History Museum responded and he like took me under his wing. I did research with him. I also did, did research with Don Prothero. He was extremely supportive. Like I've never seen a better teacher in my life. He's, <laughs> he was just wonderful, you know, like he, he went above and beyond what he could do to support his students. And like, so still to this day, I'm constantly like, I dedicate a, a lot of, you know, who I am to him and I'm really still very grateful. But yeah, so it was really the Chinese fossils that, you know, I, I, was, my, I was seeking to, um, you know, to combine my two passions. Awesome. Yeah. 
Yeah, you found it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, it's, I'm really happy. I, I don't ever want to leave, but... Why would you? Yeah. You're finding lungs and stuff. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know. Well, then, but my lungs, you know, they're suffering. Oh. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't really care about my own lungs, but if I ever wanted to have a kid, I wouldn't want to do that to them, you know, like just... Uh, yeah, Beijing's a little dicey. Sometimes, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, there are days where it's beautiful like this. I mean, it's really not as bad as sometimes people think, but like there are days when it's really bad and, uh, you know, you just... Is there any other work that you want to mention or promote? Um, any sites? Well, uh, I'm on ResearchGate. <laughs> like, oh, if ResearchGate. You write, if you, like, and I check one. it every yeah. once in a while. So if you write me a message on ResearchGate, like once a month, I will see it and like, you know, res- and I will respond. I really try to be, you know, helpful to other scientists and not just be like, you know, it's not just about me and my how many publications I get or whatever. It's not mm-hmm. about that. It is yeah. about like helping each other and sharing data and that kind of thing. Cool. Thank you so much for no, taking the thank time. You. Yeah. Thank you for listening to my excited nerd babble. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks again, Jingmei. We had a really good time chatting. And we had to edit out a little bit of our interview because it went a little long and off topic. <laughs> but if you want to hear those parts, then you can check it out on our Patreon page if you're in our patronage because then you get access to all these extra clips. Yeah, patreon.com slash inodino. And before we get into our dinosaur of the day, we want to remind you about our new sponsor, Permia. Well, new, old, I guess, because we had them on, if you've been listening, a couple of years ago, I believe, when we first met them at SVP. But we were really lucky that they were at SVP again this year. And <laughs> by we, I mostly mean me, because I was really excited when I saw that they were going, because I love all of their t-shirts, especially, and I bought about 10, I think, uh, t-shirts. I got all of their dinosaur t-shirts. And they also have a few other extinct animals like a dimetrodon, at least one pterosaur. I think there's a mosasaur in there. Lots of really cool stuff. And I also really like that they use kind of a variety of colors for their t-shirts because I don't like just wearing like black and white t-shirts all the time. So they have like green and blue and red and all sorts of really nice colors in their collection. But if you don't like all of these bright colors and you want to stick with just black and have the dinosaur stand out a little bit more because it's the colorful thing on the shirt, most of their shirts do also come in black. So you have that option too. The other cool thing about the t-shirts is that they're a two-in-one style. So on the front is a life restoration and they're all based on real modern animals. So they have really cool color patterns. You can actually, in some of them, you can kind of guess what animal it's based on if it has a sort of unique coloration and pattern to it. And then on the back of the t-shirt, there's a skeletal reconstruction of the dinosaur or I guess other extinct animal if you're into that kind of thing. (laughs) The shirts are all very soft and comfortable as well as tagless. And that's why they're my favorite dinosaur shirts. And just for our listeners, we have a special promo code and that's I know Dino. It's I K N O W D I N O, all caps, no spaces. And it'll get you $5 off all orders of $35 or more through the end of 2018. So if you want to take advantage of that, you can either go to the website and enter the promo code. But we also just have a link in our show notes that you can click on and go directly to their page with the promo code already applied and you don't have to remember it. So again, they're Permia permia.com and then you want to use the discount code i know dino to get five dollars off 35 dollars or more and now on to our dinosaur of the day zuni ceratops which was a request from dinosaur 4602 so thanks it was a ceratopsian that lived in the late cretaceous in what is now new mexico in the u.s in the moreno hill formation and it's intermediate sized for a ceratopsian it was about 9.8 to 11 and a half feet or three to three and a half meters long and it weighed about 200 to 250 pounds, or 100 to 150 kilograms. It had a long, low snout. It had large brow horns, similar to chasmosaurs and primitive centrosaurs, slightly recurved. The horns probably grew with age. Zuni ceratops was the first known ceratopsian to have brow horns, and it didn't have a nose horn. It had a thin, broad frill with a pair of large holes that were covered with skin. The frill was probably used for display. The holes would not have been good for defense. Zuni ceratops shows the evolution of early ceratopsians and the later ceratopsids that had large horns and frills. At first, Zuni ceratops was thought to have a strange squamosal, but a later study found that the squamosal was actually an ischium of another dinosaur, the Therizinosaur theropod Nasronychus. Scientists found a bone bed and they were able to determine what type of fossil it was. 
The first Zuni ceratops found had single rooted teeth, which was unusual for ceratopsians, but later finds had double rooted teeth. And that shows that the teeth became double rooted when Zuni ceratops aged. Huh. That's interesting. Yeah. That's sort of like when we grow molars, I guess. Yeah, that's a good point. Zuni ceratops was found in 1996 by eight year old Christopher James Wolfe, who's the son of Douglas Wolfe, a paleontologist, who we recently met at SVP. They found one skull and fossils from a few individuals, and then it was described in 1998 by Douglas Wolfe and James Kirkland. The type species is Zuni ceratops christopheri, and the name means Zuni horn face. Zuni's in honor of the Zuni people who lived in the region where Zuni ceratops was found, and maybe you guessed the species name refers to Christopher James Wolfe. Zuni ceratops is the oldest species found in North America, and that helps show that they evolved in North America instead of Asia. Zuni ceratops lived about 89 to 93 million years ago. It was an herbivore, possibly lived in herds. There was also a possible Zuni ceratops track found in New Mexico. Researchers found 13 footprints of small, medium, and large tyrannosaurs. The tracks are parallel, which may indicate a, quote, family group moving in concert, according to Douglas Wolfe. The tracks start in a straight line and then change direction and veer off. Wolf's wife, Hazel, saw a round footprint where the tyrannosaur tracks swerve, and there are small piles of sediment that may indicate the animal with the round footprint kicked up some sand when it ran away. It's possible the round footprint belongs to Zuni ceratops. This track site may show that tyrannosaurs hunted together, though we need more data to know for sure. Other dinosaurs found in the same area include an unnamed hadrosaur, a dromaeosaurid, and a therizinosaur. You can see a Zuni ceratops at the Arizona Museum of Natural History in Mesa, and you can also see one on Discovery Channel's When Dinosaurs Roamed America, which aired in 2001. And this fun fact comes partly from Erickson's talk that we covered earlier. Utkiavik, Alaska, formerly Barrow, Alaska, is in the Arctic Circle and one of the farthest north cities in the world, and that means during the late Cretaceous, the average temperature was about 37 to 47 degrees Fahrenheit, or 3 to 8 degrees Celsius, but today it averages just 10 degrees Fahrenheit, or negative 12 degrees Celsius. But even though there was such a big temperature difference in northern Alaska at Utkiavik, down in Juneau, Alaska, the temperature was about the same as it is today back in the Cretaceous, which is about 42 degrees Fahrenheit, or 6 degrees Celsius. Still cold. Yeah, (laughs) but... (laughs) And because of this big difference in temperatures, that means that dinosaurs back in the Mesozoic probably needed pretty different adaptations to live in these different climates. So even though it's all Alaska, you'd probably see pretty different dinosaurs in Juneau versus Barrow slash Utkiavik. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And check out our page and Patreon at patreon.com slash inodino for cool rewards. Thanks again, and until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at inodino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to inodino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at inodino.